This is a production of Cornell University. Um, so I lifted this photo from the New York Times this morning. <laughs> and um, the reason I put it in here is because it reminds me when things don't go right, why I keep doing this. So this was in India and it says, when rains fall, fail, it compounds other problems. This year, a pest infestation in Maharashtra um, combined with drought um, devastated the millet and corn in India. So that's why I keep doing this. <laughs> um, and so what I want to talk about today is, um, I realized I hadn't really talked much about what I've done in the last several years, and that's look at the benzexazinoid pathway. These are major defense compounds in some cereals, but not all of them. And uh, you can see the different types of benzoxazinoids and their acronyms depicted below. Um, and they're found in maize, wheat, and to some extent in rye and barley. But they're not found in rice, oat, cultivated barley, or sorghum. <coughs> um, they might play other roles within the plant, such as signaling. And here's um, where all the genes involved in the benzoxazinoid pathway are located on the 10 chromosomes in maize. Um, you can see a couple things at, um, looking at this. The uh, letter A, there's a small gene cluster there, um, which is important. Yeah, I'm going to talk mostly about that cluster in this talk. And then there's another cluster on chromosome 4, which is, um, which is depicted by the letter F which is the core benzoxazinoid gene cluster, BX1 through BX5. Here's the pathway. Um, they all, um, everything's derived from I3PG um, up here, which leads to indole in one of three branches. One ulti ultimately goes to tryptophan. One makes volatile, well, it makes indole, which is going to um, turn into volatile. And uh, then the other indole is the core benzoxazinoid pathway that I'll talk about. Um, so this part of the pathway happens in the chloroplasts. And then there's four um, monooxygenases that lead to the first toxic compound, diboa. And that's um, ultimately dec decorated a little bit more in the cytoplasm into these other toxic compounds and eventually transported into the vacuole. Um, in particular, they're, they're all glycosylated. You'll notice there's a sugar, a glucose on each end of that, and that prevents uh, autotoxicity in the plant. Um, so I'm gonna, the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on this part of the pathway um, where BX10, 11, 12, and 14 can catalyze the conversion of dimboaglucoside to H-dimboaglucoside which are two of the most toxic compounds in the pathway. Um, BX10 and 11 are induced upon a liver herbivory, and um, BX12 is constitutive. BX14 is, it, it can accept emboa uh, glycoside as a um, substrate, but it's not known exactly how much um, it converts it into h dimboa glyc um, relative to the other two. Okay, so upon a rivery, what happens is the tissue gets ma um, macerated and you lose the membranes of the chloroplast and the vacuole. And what that does is because there's um, glucosidases stored in the chloroplasts and they cleave the sugar off of the dimboaglucoside and h dimboaglucoside, which leads to the toxic compounds dimboa and h dimboa. So the pictures here represent what they do to aphids. If you have um, Dimboa, even though H. Dimboa is more toxic, um, Dimboa, Dimboa induces the um, formation of callose, which is a poly polysaccharide, which prevents the aphids from sticking their stylets into the plant. So you actually get fewer aphids um, if the pathway is blocked here than if it goes all the way and makes the more toxic compound. The opposite is true of caterpillars. Because it's more toxic, um, if the pathway is blocked here, the caterpillars do better where um, Dimboa is and worse if it goes all the way to H Dimboa, the more toxic compound. So a few years back in our lab, we, uh, 
a natural transposon knockout was found in BX12. And what, what just to take away from here, is if the, you get the transposon knockout, it blocks that conversion from DIMBOA to HDIMBOA. And you get DIMBOA here, so the aphids do worse. And if it goes, if the gene doesn't have the transposon, the aphids do, or the caterpillars do worse. So that's, that's the trade-off between the aphids and the caterpillars. So piercing insects versus chewing insects, opposite effects. Um, this was a paper that came out just last year. And note that things are flipped here, and they also grouped the uh, NAM founders into their respective tropical, temperate, or mixed um, uh, origins. So um, what they did in the top is they replicated what was done in our lab, and they, they con basically confirmed what we saw. But in the bottom, they added uh, several teosinte accessions, the ancestors of, ancestor of maize. And what they found out is none of the teosinte accessions have the uh, transposon knockout blocking the pathway. So that excited me because prior to this, oh, I forgot about this part. Um, so uh, the other thing that they uh, found in this paper was that the nucleotide diversity differed around the transposon on both sides. And in teosinte, it was more diverse. And uh, moving from tropical to temperate maize, there was less and less nucleotide diversity around the insertion, um, indicating that this was probably a target of selection, either directly or indirectly. But what you'll notice is that the transposon does not segregate with all temperate inbreds, which is kind of weird. So that suggests that it wasn't ancestral and that the diversion, this transposon event, happened sometime um, after tropical and temperate diverged and then diverged within the tropical uh, as, as maize was uh, expanding its range. Meanwhile, <laughs> um, my advisor was in Mexico and he had collected 214 teosinte accessions from Lanjebio that happened to be growing there. He sampled two plants per accession and brought them back to me um, to make extract DNA. So I did some PCR and I found the transposon in eight, no, nine out of uh, the 214 I'd screened, represented on the bottom here in one of the parvoglumis lines. Um, so I was excited about this because this refuted the information in the paper, right? And that it's ancestral and wasn't, didn't, the transposon event didn't happen during domestication. Um, and I confirmed them by sequencing, it was real. Uh, so I ordered the teosinte accessions from Simit, and uh, I also found some teosinte in my seed cooler um, that I sort of threw in as controls, a couple of different lines. And then importantly, also the Dobley lines that were, um, I had a little bit of the seed from the Dobley lines that were in the, the paper. Um, one thing you'll notice though, is that a lot of these came from the same place in elevation and Albatan. Um, so I moved forward and I planted these things. Uh, Teosinte germination is known to be generally poor and variable. Um, Dobley Lab recommends chipping the seed, but when I tried that, Teosinte seed went flying and uh, it, it, it would have been too much work. So I tried three germination methods um, on paper towels in a Petri dish, imbibed in water overnight, and um, I directly sowed them in pots. And, Luckily, directly sown in the pots worked the best. I got the best germination. So I moved forward with my aphid bioassay. I planted six seeds of each, of each accession, an aphid performance bioassay, transferred the seedlings to a chamber 15 days after planting, and then I caged the uh, aphids using plastic bread bags. Um, and then uh, as I infested the plants, I concurrently harvested two tissue samples one for DNA extraction to confirm the insertion in the plants, and then one for downstream uh, benzoxazinoid profiling. Um, and I allowed the aphids to feed on the plant for one week before scoring aphid survivorship and fecundity. Meanwhile, I extracted DNA and performed PCR, um, but the primers I used to conf uh, confirm the dopia insertion, the transposon, um, 
I couldn't recover any of them in the cement lines. Here are my controls, the original um, PCR ampli amplicons I uh, generated from the DNA that um, George collected. And uh, so when I tried to amplify the wild type allele, you can see I amplified it in just about everything, indicating that this was probably a heterozygous insertion, meaning it's probably not fixed in the teosinte is what I took away with it. Interestingly, there's a couple polymorphisms here, um, which indicate that uh, something's going on in teosinte. It's not just, uh, the, the alleles can be different at least. Um, so yeah. And then uh, I got my, a week later, I went back and looked at my aphids, my results, and all the aphids were dead on all my cement lines, but the aphids survived and reproduced on the Dobley lines and the BTI lines that I threw in for a control. So I went back to the seed envelopes and I looked at them and I found this red residue on here. And <laughs> I wrote to cement and uh, they confirmed that they treat the seed with a systemic insecticide to resist pests during growth. <laughs> so double whammy. <laughs> So my conclusion is Teosinte readily hybridizes with maize. The initial PCR results are probably the results of admixture in the Teosinte seed that, uh, or the Teosinte plants that George had collected in Mexico. So I'm not going to move forward with this anymore. Um, one thing I could do is all these Teosinte lines have dart seed data at CIMIT, and I could look for evidence of SNP polymorphisms between modern maize and teosinte to, to nail it down, but I don't think it's worth it. Um, so here's a little afterward. I, there's still variation in desoxazenoid accumulation in the NAM founders that affects um, aphid performance. And it's not across the board, it's, it's variable. So I decided to sequence across the uh, gene using the C CML247 sequence that's available at maize GDB designed primers to it, amplified across it. And uh, as expected, all the cement maze lines amplified the full length gene, along with the um, North Carolina lines, which are from a tropical background themselves. The weird one was TZI8, which looks like it has some sort of deletion um, in the background. And yet, if you look at panel B and panel C on the right, it's still converting some Dimboa glucoside to H Dimboa glucoside. So that's weird. So the question is there, is one of the other benzoxazenoid paralogs that are normally induced compensating for that constitutively? And with that, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, my committee, Denise down at Simit, um, Rory Sawyers now at Penn State, formerly of Longhebio, um, all my TA funding to keep my life going, uh, the Greenhouse staff and the Jander Labs, and of course, Synapsis. Thanks everybody. Questions? Have we got time for a few questions? Mike. So what are you going for for the profile? Was it really that, that on the last slide, that second to the last line was the optimal profile? The I think it, it produces both. So presumably it would do the callus and kill the caterpillar? Yeah, uh, yeah, so um, Mike is asking, what was I going for? I'm looking for the callos to kill the caterpillar. Oh, that, so that's not quite right. So when you have the um, BX12 knockout, it induces callos, which prevents aphids from feeding on them. I'm kind of in my work, as a lot of you know, I've been working with fall armyworm as well. And so I'm more interested in the intact gene. And the question was really, this was more of a, when did this transposon thing arise sort of question. That was, a, that was kind of what I was going for. Um, but really what I would want is to find lines that have the, um, that don't have the transposon that make more H. Dimboa that could prevent uh, caterpillar herbivory in, in my main work. We have time for one more quick question, if anyone has. 
If not, then let's give Kevin another round of applause. And Thanks, everybody. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.